In section 7.1, we saw that there are two ways to interpret the area under a normal curve. Um, the first way is to think of that area as the proportion of the entire population that would be within that interval of values. The other way is the probability, um, the chances that a single individual is in that interval of values. And we had this example here of the giraffes, and we found that this number here was 0 0.3085, and that meant that 30% um, of giraffes are in this weight and so on. And the question is, where does the 0 0.3085 come from? Well, that's what we're going to do in section 7.2. We're going to learn how to find that area. Now, the normal curve has this as its function, believe it or not. So that is a very large, very complicated function. It's the probability density function for a normal curve. And it's extremely complicated. It's so complicated um, that no Calculus 1 instructor would do it. it. It's usually a Calculus 2 topic. And often then it's not even covered because it's tricky. But we, of course, are not going to do that by hand. No way. We're going to use a calculator. It will find the error under this normal curve for us. And the instructions are all here. OK, so let's go down here and look at this example. We're going to assume that x is normally distributed. We're going to find the following probabilities. We're going to include an appropriately shaded and labeled, shaded and labeled picture, um, which means you're going to have to put your numbers down in appropriate spots. You're going to have to shade the appropriate region, and you're going to have to label everything. And you're going to give your calculator entry and then four decimal places for your result. OK, so let's look at the first one. The mean is 20, which is the central line. The inflection points happen two away from that. Now remember the inflection points are about where the first uh, standard deviation falls. Or, um, so they're about, if you take the halfway spot between the lowest and the highest part of the hill, they're kind of just a little bit above the halfway spot. Right, so that would get you 20 in the middle, uh, 19 will be a little bit on the left, but not fully uh, standard deviation away, because a full standard deviation away would be at 18, and then 23.5 would be over on the right. So my plan is to have a picture just appear magically when I copy and paste it in. Let's see if I can get it to work. There it is. All right, so you can see that I've labeled my mean line, which is 20 down the middle. I have 19 over here on the left, but it's not all the way to a full standard deviation away. It's very important that you um, place the vertical lines in appropriate spots. And 23.5 is over here. Now we want to find that area. Now, this is a time where you want to pull out those pages in the back of your course pack, and you want to use them. We want, in particular, the Chapter 7 Decision Matrix, which looks like this. Okay, so let's think about this. We want to know, we want to find, so over here on the green side, we want to find the probability right up here at the top, the first row. We want to find probability. You can see it says area, percent, probability, and so on. We already know up here on the um, yellow area, we already know x values. We know an x value of 19 and an x value of 23.5 because that's what this portion in the parentheses is telling us. X's are right there. So I know my X values and I want a probability right right there. Okay, so if I go back to the decision matrix and you just want to have this on you at all times, remember that this will be given to you when you go to take your test. You don't have to put it on your note sheet. It will just be given to you. That whole packet will be given to you when you take your exams. So we no x values, we want probability, so we're in the um, top row right corner. It says use normal CDF left comma right comma mu comma sigma. C notes one and three. Well, we don't have areas without bounds, so we don't have to worry too much about that. Um, normal CDF is in the distribution menu, so that's what we're going to look at. So let me grab a calculator, clear all this out. Distribution is above the VARS button, V-A-R-S, which stands for variables. So you hit second, distribution. And we always want, um, for area under the curve, we want normal CDF, so number two. All right, now it's saying what's the lower edge, what's the upper edge, what's the mean, and what's the sigma, the standard deviation. So let me switch this out of here for a second. Okay. So when we look at the what we've shaded, the left-hand edge, the lower edge of what we shaded was 19. Enter. There we go. The upper edge was 23.5. Right there. Right? It literally wants, I will, I 
give me the left hand edge the lower edge give me the right hand edge the upper edge and I will find you the area in between those two and that's what the decision matrix is telling us to do it says left comma right mu sigma left is the lower bound right is the upper bound right so I want to tell it my mu which was 20 I want to tell it my sigma which is 2 then I go to paste it right with the distribution menu just like with the binomials it actually pastes this value in just in case you wanted to do something else with it but we just want to find it we don't really want to do anything with this so to tell the calculator to run this I'm just going to press enter again and there it is and that is what I type in for my work because it says to show the calculator entry right there calculator entry so I'm going to type in that calculator entry and rounding to four decimal places that area was about 0.6514 okay now we're gonna do it all again <laughs> over and over and over so this one has a central line of 75 Sigma is 8 on this one and I want the probability that X is greater than 90 okay so we're talking about being over on the far right because 75 is in the middle 90 is over to the right from that and being greater than 90 means you're just going to keep going and going and going to the right so there we have it 75 is in the center 90 is over here on the right quite a bit over to the right as a matter of fact it's not quite two standard deviations away but it's close because two standard deviations would have been 91 right so we're really close to that okay so let's go back to the decision matrix and let's look it says we need to know an X value and we want to know a probability we're in the same corner we were before normal CDF left comma right comma mu comma Sigma all right so if I look at my region that I've shaded let me move my calculator over I want normal CDF so I'm gonna grab the distribution menu I'm gonna grab number two normal CDF so for that left hand edge we want to say 90 because that's the left hand edge of what we shaded it's the lower bound of what we shaded now the upper bound that's a little tricky because this goes on forever and ever remember a normal curve has a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis meaning it never reaches it it never touches it so when we go back to look at the decision matrix if you look at note 3 it says for infinite bounds use either negative 1 e99 for the left side or positive 1 e99 for the right side well if you look at the tail we're shading here this is a right side tail so we want to tell it hey go on forever here so forever for us according to the decision matrix is going to be 1 e99 now that e that's in there is kind of a special e it's the one that's above your comma button if you see that double e right there so you're going to hit second comma and it looks like a little block letter e that stands for scientific notation it means it's one times 10 to the and then you type 99 basically it's shorthand for infinity <laughs> you're telling your calculator go to infinity go forever so take 90 and go to forever quote unquote but your calculator doesn't have a forever so you tell it 1 e 99 and notice this is increasing without bound forever and ever and ever that's why it uses 1e99 e it's right there in the decision matrix it tells you for infinite bounds for a right side infinite bound you're going to use 1e99 e for the right side if it's the left bound which we're about to see you use the other one okay so that gave us an answer of 0 0.0304 so let me type that up and that's your work quote unquote for this problem so um, the, the, the finding the number part is it's points and it's worth stuff but also shading this appropriately labeling labeling it appropriately that 90 is almost two standard deviations away you don't have to be perfect but you shouldn't draw that anywhere close to the 75 for example nor should it be out in the itty bitty tail you should know eh, it's roughly a couple standard deviations away so I'll put it roughly where you see it on the graph as a matter of fact this particular program I'm using this perfectly so this computer program is placing that 90 exactly where it should be placed you and you're doing it by hand should be somewhat close to that and I can't be more specific than that but um, I shouldn't be able to uh, be jarred by the naked eye just looking at it going whoa that's way off right so it should be somewhere in that range okay 
hey, this looks like our giraffe problem. That's because it is. So the mean was 2200, the sigma is 200, should sound familiar. I want the probability that x is less than 2100. Hmm. Okay, well, 2200 is in the middle. 2100 is not that far away from that because its standard deviation is 200, and 2100 is only one um, standard deviation. 2100 is half a standard deviation away to the left. Oops. So that means that I'm not going to go very far to the left. And this was a time I couldn't fit 2200 in horizontally because these numbers are too big, so I put it in vertically. 2100, there it is, only a half a standard deviation away. It's not even to the inflection point. As a matter of fact, it's halfway to the inflection point because the inflection, inflection point was 200 away. All right, this is a left-hand picture, so let's go back to the decision matrix. Again, we know x values, and again, we want to know probability. So we're still sitting in this top right corner of normal CDF, left, comma, right. But this is an infinite bound to the left side. So we actually want to use negative 1E99 for our left side. So let me grab the calculator, go to distribution, grab number 2, normal CDF. And my left-hand edge of this shaded region, because this shaded region goes forever, I basically want to tell the calculator negative infinity. But the calculator doesn't have a negative infinity. So I tell it negative 1e99. E That's what note number 3 says on that decision matrix, which you should have stapled and out next to you at all times from this point on to the end of the course. Right? And then you tell it 2100. And then you tell it the mean is 2200 and you tell it the sigma is 200, enter, paste. And then you have to enter it again, right? So paste, paste it into the calculator's main screen, but then you have to press enter to run it. And that tells you that, hey, there's that 0 0.3085 that we ran into in the previous section. I was not lying to you, it really is 0 0.3085. And there is your work for the problem by writing out normal CDF and you write exactly what you typed. Negative 1 E99. Remember that E stands for times 10 to the it's scientific notation. It actually stands for the word exponentiate, meaning you want exponents times 10 to the, right? 2100, 2200, 200, and you get 0 0.3085. And now you know I did not lie to you in regards to that giraffe problem a few pages ago. All right, let's do one more. Now this one's going to be the most complicated. The mean is 180, sigma is 12, and I want the chances that x is less than 165, so that's a number over on the left, I want to be less than that, or greater than 200. Well, 165 is a little bit more than a standard deviation away, because the standard deviation is worth 12, and 165 is 15 away. 200 is 20 away, so that's about a standard deviation and a half or so, a little bit more. Okay, so we want the area in both tails. So the key is that word or that's in there. See that? We learned in chapter five that a probability involving or means you have to add. So that's what we're gonna have to do. We could add the two tails together. So you could find the area in the left tail, which is the less than 65. You could find the area in the right tail, which is the more than 200, and then you could add them up. All right, that seems like a lot of work, right? So this or business right here, that's kind of tricky, right? That's kind of a big deal. All right, well, there is another way. In chapter five, not only we did learn that if you have an or, you need to add, but we also learned that if you know the area, or excuse me, if you know that there are probabilities, you know that the entire thing must add up to one, right? The area underneath the entire normal curve has got to add up to one. Well, how does that help us? Well, we know that this whole curve makes one. If I could just find what this central area here in the middle is, right, kind of the stuffing to my Oreo here. So if I could find what that middle stuffing is worth percentage wise, I could subtract it from 100% from one, and I'll know what my two tails must have been adding to. In other words, I want the area in both my tails. Well, it doesn't really change how you do the problem because it's still a normal CDF problem, right? That's how you're going to find your area in the center. You know the X values involved. You know X is 165 and X is 200. So if I go back to the decision matrix, I still know my X values, 165 and 200, and I want to know a probability, so I'm still looking at normal CDF. But we're going to find the, the area of that central area and then take it away from one. Okay, so let's look at the central area. The central area is normal CDF, 
and I'm going to tell it 165 because that central area ends, that white area ends at 165, and then it goes to 200, and then the mean is 180, and my standard deviation is 12. I'm going to go paste this in, and then I can press enter. And that gives me 0.8466. So what I want to do is take 1 minus 0.8466. And that would get me my final result. Which if I do this on the calculator, 1 minus second answer, second negative, will do it. Now there is one other trick to this. You can actually type it all at once. This is why distributions have paste instead of calculate at the bottom. So if I type 1 minus, then go to my normal distribution, choose number two, and there all that stuff is, so I just leave that in there, and I paste it in. It's like copying and pasting, it's pasting it into my equation. So if I press enter right now, it actually does the probability, finds it for me, and subtracts it from one all in one step. Nice, huh?